It's been an exciting offseason for the Arizona Diamondbacks as they try to get back to the World Series, and they are calling upon a former member of the team to come back and help them get back there. Steve Zinsmeister, Alex Weiner on the Ain't No Fang podcast. Thanks for checking us out this week as Lourdes Gurriel is back, Alex, and Purple Hair is back in the dugout, assuming that he continues to rock purple hair i mean i would assume so why not i don't know i mean i I guess you could try to change it up year by year like now that they have new uniforms does it go with the teal hair oh see that would be be, pina but that'd be interesting i suppose yeah well everybody else is talking yamamoto and it feels like everything is kind of grinded to a halt as everyone's waiting for yoshinobu yamamoto to sign pina power is back not officially yet um so we'll see they're gonna have to make a roster move because it's currently a 40-man roster with 40 players on it, and he's oh. not one of them. So that's something to kind of look out as far as like, okay, who's going to get, you know, knocked off. But uh, yeah, reportedly, according to basically everybody at this point, Lord Escariel Jr., three years, 42 million. So an AAV of 14 million a year. That's about right. Yeah. That's actually maybe a little less than I would have thought based on. I thought maybe 17, roughly. Yeah. I don't know why I had that number in my head, but. I feel like I had something similar in my head, but okay. regardless, they get him for 14 a year. Maybe he, he a, took a bit of a hometown discount. Not that this so? is his hometown by any means, but, you know, being a player who very, played here. Yeah, he was very, like, complimentary of his experience with the Diamondbacks during the World Series when asked about it, for sure, and a good clubhouse presence. So maybe there could be something there, but opt out after year two, club option after year three. So this could potentially be four more years of Guriel with the Diamondbacks. So that's a player opt out after two or is that a club yeah, like he can opt out after two okay and there's a club option so what i like about this deal is that it's kind of beneficial to both sides in that not just the money that's at play here but if lordis guriel goes off over the next two seasons then he can go and test free agency again and at age 32 i think he would be he could test the market again for another contract of significant length uh, meanwhile, if it doesn't go well, then the team can get out of the deal as well. So they can make it long term if they see that it's a good fit. He can make it long term if he thinks it's a good fit. He can get out early. They can get out early. It seems kind of like the ideal fit of a structure for a contract of a guy who's 30 years old. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It definitely gives them some flexibility there. And it's interesting, too, with you know the two years guaranteed. Because you kind of look up and down their roster right now, and you know part of it's built for the long haul. Corbin being there long term, Catal Marte being long term, all of the younger guys. But at the same time, there's clearly kind of like a two-year window here, because Gallon has two more years of team control. Kelly has an op- t- a team option for 25, so he has two more years of team control. Suarez has two more years of team control, and now there's two guaranteed deal years on. Guriel's contract and so this is sort of the, what the team looks like minus you know guys who are entering their last year like Christian Walker and Paul Seawald you know most of the team is sort of here for these next couple of runs and the way that this is set up you at least guarantee yourself that Guriel is going to be part of that mix for those two and then potentially long term if everything goes right yeah and they didn't commit this offseason beyond that with pretty much anybody but Eduardo Rodriguez mm-hmm. And so you're right. There is clearly a window that they're shooting for. Um, We can talk here in a minute about what's next. And we've talked about a full time DH, which appears to still be an option on the table for them. I would think, you know, the names that are tied to them, Justin Turner, uh, J.D. Martinez, I would think those are guys that likely fit that one or two year window as well. So it really does start to paint the picture of, okay, the Diamondbacks are in it to win it for the next couple of years. And if it doesn't go their way, they can kind of reset by some of these contracts coming off the books. Yeah, absolutely. And with Corbin Carroll being there for as long as he's going to be and Moreno and Perdomo and Jordan Lawler. And, you know, we'll see what they get in the future down the road from like Drew Jones or Tommy Troy. So, right. um, yeah, it does feel like, you know, a couple of sections. And it's funny, maybe we'll get to this a little bit later, but Zach Allen wrote in the Players' Tribune this week and he said the way that the postseason felt, the way that the silly ra- city rallied around the team, it felt like a new era of Diamondbacks baseball. And I feel like that's apt based on what happened last year and the way that they have responded by dishing out the most expensive roster in team history already, and it doesn't seem like they're done. So, you know, could this be like a three-year window and then, you know, you have opportunities to pivot and still build around your young core position players who are going to be here for the long term? Um, Maybe they send it, maybe they get extensions for some of the guys who are coming off. We'll see. But for right now, it feels like, yeah, this is a pretty golden opportunity for them and they're going all in. 
Gurriel made sense for a lot of reasons. Um, being a right-handed outfield bat, something they were certainly looking at, uh, you know, assuming they didn't want to run an all left-handed outfield every mm-hmm. day. Um, so that made sense. Uh, a guy who has been here before, you know, he was here for the last calendar year and they got to know Lourdes. They know how good of a clubhouse presence he is, what kind of leader he can be on this team. This, by the way, makes the Gabby Moreno, Lourdes Gurriel, Dalton Varsho trade look even better yeah. now. Yeah. Now that you get some longevity out of Gurriel rather than just the one season. Um and it's worth noting, too, that of the three major moves that the Diamondbacks made this offseason with him, Suarez and Rodriguez, is they have a level of comfort with the three of them that you might not have with a brand new free agent to your team. Meaning there's always a risk that you go and sign some guy. I don't know. I'm just going to throw a name out there like a Blake Snell. And it turns out that he's a diva or that he's not really in it for the team or, you know, something like that. Whereas they're signing, you know, Rodriguez, Mike Hazen and Tori Lovello know from their days in Boston. Gurriel, they obviously know from the World Series run last year. Uh, even Suarez, who they may not have direct relationship with, by all accounts, he is the clubhouse guy for the Seattle Mariners. Like, they Seattle could, fans yeah. are bummed that he's gone. They could have asked Seawald, too. Somebody Seawald, with sure. Link sure. There. So. so, in a lot of ways, they've avoided certain risks that you usually take with big acquisitions in the offseason. Yeah, um, you know, there's always risk with this stuff. I mean, it's a four-year contract for for Eduardo Rodriguez. There's a level of risk to that, but at the same time, you're totally right about them knowing him. They knew the younger version of him, but they had a two-hour conversation with him at the winter meetings in Nashville. Um, kind of got a good feel for it and, you know, felt comfortable enough to give him a four-year deal that could turn into a five-year deal. And if it's a five-year deal, you know, that becomes, you know, an even more lucrative contract than what they gave out to Madison Bumgarner, uh, potentially. Right now, it's not guaranteed, but um, it could potentially be the biggest, you know, contract they've given out since the Zach Grinke deal before Hazen was even there. So there's level of risk to it. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right that knowing sort of the makeup of some of these guys, getting some leadership in that clubhouse too, they're already counting on the young core getting better and better every year. So going into last year, I think Hazen has said this where, you know, the biggest part of improvement is going to be from within. And, you know, a lot of ways that turned out to be correct because Corbin Carroll became Corbin Carroll last year. And that was a huge reason why they made it. There was obviously other reasons, Cattell Marte bouncing back, what they got out of Moreno and out of Lourdes Gurriel. But now going into this year, they're also gonna be counting on, okay, the young core getting better, get like getting even better will also be a driving force. But now you have some more veteran voices, some more veterans who fill roles and are expected to perform at a certain level. It, it, it does feel like the floor has risen a lot from this team from where they were a year ago. I think there's something to be said, too, for the Diamondbacks, not just filling holes, but adding to the team that they already had. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, what did they really lose in the offseason? Well, they were losing Lourdes Gurriel, Tommy Pham, and Evan Longoria, but third base wasn't really very productive at all last year for them, so that's not much of a loss. Tommy Pham, they still have yet to replace the DH officially uh, if they choose to do that. And Lourdes Gurriel is back, so there's your core. So getting Suarez, getting Rodriguez is on top of what production you were already getting from your squad, and it, you're not operating at a net loss, is what I'm saying. As opposed to some teams like the Dodgers, let's say, obviously get Shohei Otani, that's a huge addition no matter what squad he's going to. And by no means am I saying that J.D. Martinez is as good as Shohei Otani, but Otani is replacing Martinez at DH for the Dodgers. So while, yes, they got better, it, it, they were still filling a hole that they had from the offseason. Whereas I feel like the Diamondbacks, they got most of their squad back or they're in it for the long haul. And then they were able to go and add on top of the team that they already were. Does that make sense? I think so. I think especially with the pitching staff, too. As yeah. Like what they did and didn't get out of the veterans they had last year with Zach Davies, uh, Zach Davies and... Um, Madison Bumgarner, you know, they've had to rely on a lot of the younger guys. So you're adding on top of what they had for most mo- most of last season with Rodriguez. Suarez, you, you kind of take the production from a few guys and now you have the one solidifier there and you can kind of be a little bit more versatile with your roster there. I do think they'll miss Longoria in the clubhouse and he had stretches during the season where he got hot. But you're right, as a full year, third base was a weak spot and they went and fixed that. Um, Guriel, you know, was there last year. So it's, you know, it's not really like, you know, adding necessarily. It's, it's kind of keeping what you have there. But um, I totally agree that like they have stacked pieces to raise the floor where it was. 
Um, I don't know. It's hard for me to say anything else other than like the Dodgers are kind of doing the same thing um, with Otani because not only, I mean, yeah, he's technically he's going to replace JD Martinez this year, but uh, next year he's going to replace Clayton Kershaw. So. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it was just an example in the in the interim of but, like the Diamondbacks and then the Tyler Glass got everybody move. back. So yeah, right. absolutely. No, you, no, you're right. They they you know they've pretty much um, they've definitely. I mean, obviously it's a you know net positive from where they were last year and. Um, We'll see what they do with with DH two um, because I mean that's that's like the one spot that you have left that it's like okay really what are we gonna what are we looking at here and right, internally and um, you know for pitching it, it, they have guys who have performed for them like at least in spurts like with a five starter spot you know could they go to Tommy Henry or Ryan Nelson and expect some improvement in the next year well in the DH spot you know you could you know move it around with Jake McCarthy playing in the outfield and Gurriel DHing against right-handed pitching against lefties. I don't entirely sure what you do at that point, unless you kept your three outfielders. So yeah, that, that feels like the only spot Could play left. Marte at DH and play Lawler in the infield. If he starts with the major league club. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. But I'm, he's going to have a role in the major league club at some point. So right. Yeah, this this is a lot of moving around. So let's talk DH a little bit deeper. Then Uh, it's been reported by several outlets that the Diamondbacks are still in pursuit in their off season of adding another bat to this lineup, which is huge news because they're already on pace to have one of the highest payrolls, if not the highest payroll in their history. Yeah, the highest. And so I questioned, we questioned, even just last week. Uh, how much money they would have left to go out and spend in their budget. Um, I think this is a great um, notion from ownership, from Ken Kendrick, that they definitely want to be competitive in that window we talked about. And so could I see them adding a Justin Turner at age 39? Sure. Uh, After the season he had in Boston or J.D. Martinez, who now apparently has been replaced in L.A. and certainly grabbing a player that you're familiar with there as well. Yeah. So I think that that would be a really nice fit. How much money do they have? I don't know. Can they go and spend 15 million more per season on one of these guys? I don't know if that's the number. Uh, It's probably going to be north of 10, though. I would definitely think north of 10 or 12 for one of those two, probably, especially J.D. Yeah, I mean, Jorge Soler, they've been linked to. The problem here, though, is, I think, um, is that a lot of these hitters are being linked to other clubs that are considered the big market clubs that are missing out on guys. Soler has been linked to Seattle, who has made several plays at big players over the last couple of years. Cut payroll a lot this year, though. They cut payroll, but I wonder if they did that in hopes of pursuing certain names. Now, would that be Soler? Probably not. Um, but the New York Mets have been looking at Justin Turner reportedly. I'm sure a lot of teams are interested in J.D. Martinez. I've heard about the Blue Jays trying to go and get big names. So the Diamondbacks face a difficult spot where, yeah, those names would be great to add to your roster, and you've got an open DH spot that you can give them playing time pretty much every day, Um, but so do a lot of other teams. But do they want to come here? I mean that's that's another big part of it too. It's you know even if they get outbid necessarily, is JD Martinez looking for the highest bidder or is he looking for somewhere he's played before, somewhere he's going to be competitive and play every day? Um, and then you know back to the point like at the beginning of the show where I mentioned like oh the Yamamoto news new, the Yamamoto news has dominated headlines um, because of that. There's you know we haven't heard a lot about a ton of free agents. Even besides Turner and Martinez, who could potentially fit the mold of a designated hitter type for the Diamondbacks, like is Mitch Garver somebody to look at? He's thirty. He's going to be thirty-two, I believe, or maybe no, he is thirty-two. I think he's going to turn thirty-three. Um, health has been an issue, but in a, you know a perfect world, he's your backup catcher slash your designated hitter, and is, you know, what does his price point look like? Or maybe somebody like, I don't know, Jock Peterson, who is a left-handed bat, but at the same time has been, you know, better than average hitter for a long time, for most of his career, except for a couple of down seasons in the middle there. But the last couple of years of the Giants weren't too bad, especially 2022. Carlos Santana, potential guy who can give Christian Walker a rest once in a while at first base. Also, you know, an average to above average hitter, good clubhouse guy, already has rapport with some of the guys like Suarez and Seawald who are with the Mariners. I think he got nominated for a gold glove last year, too. I think so, yeah. So, I don't think he 
he didn't win it obviously no but no he but got nominated yeah and then obviously there's still fam out there who he said that he wants an everyday role and while the diamondbacks dh spot isn't necessarily an everyday role it's you know still a pretty sizable role given that the construction of the roster is right now depends on what exactly they do with their infielders and um so there's some figuring out to do still but i mean there's still a ton of options out there even if you don't get turner or martinez even though if you do then that's obviously the ideal scenario so i'm going to assume if the diamondbacks do go and get a dh that probably doesn't leave a lot of money left over. Now, you'd like to get a backup catcher. If it's not Mitch Garver, then you know maybe you're going and getting a lower-end catcher to be your backup next season. They just reportedly signed um, someone for, to a minor league contract. So, I mean, he's a 26-year-old catcher named Ronaldo Hernandez from the Red Sox system. I don't know. He's been pretty good in AAA last couple of seasons. So he's they, it's another name that they're throwing into the pot there with Jose Herrera and Adrian Del Castillo, who's a younger guy, but may not be quite ready yet. Just made AAA last year. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, there's, it's not clear right now. It seems like Herrera is the front runner there. But, yeah, you, you're right. That could be I something. thought Tom Murphy would have made a lot of sense. He ended up going to the Giants two years, $8 million, I think. And that was around the price point that I kind of expected for a Diamondbacks backup catcher. Um, because, obviously, you want to get Gabby Moreno behind the dish as much as possible. But you don't want to run him ragged. Yeah. Um, so he needs somebody for, like, 40 games. Yeah. Could I see him throwing, a, you know, being behind the plate for 100 to 120 games? Like, I, I could maybe see see that um you know health permitting but um backup catcher seems to be something they would look into uh i think the bullpen is fine uh which is weird to say because i don't know if i've ever said that during an offseason before um i think the rotation i mean obviously at the top you're you're stacked but you know you still have that question mark in the fifth spot in the rotation and maybe that's one of the biggest questions going into 2024 because i assume this is probably one of the last times we'll talk in 2023 Going into the new year, I think the fifth spot in the rotation is probably the only thing that's really up in the air, and I don't think we'll have an answer to that until the end of spring training. Yeah, yeah, it seems like, you know, it'll come down to, and Hazen mentioned incumbency when asked about this during the Eduardo Rodriguez intro presser, um, where it's like, okay, Tommy Henry, Ryan Nelson, those are the two guys who had a pretty sizable role in the rotation last season. Um, Nelson is, you know, here and working. Um how Henry is, you know, got hurt at the end of last season, but was throwing live BPs during the postseason. So um, those are two options, obviously. And then you have like the Slate Sacconis, Bryce Jarvis, now Blake Walson's on the 40 man roster. So, so they have a bunch of guys who can compete for that spot. But, um, and, and it's not, you know, Henry was, you know, pretty consistent for them last year when he was there. He kind of looked the prototypical, you know, back end starter who can give you reliable innings. Not spectacular, but has some really good starts. It's about a four ERA guy. So, um, yeah, that's that's going to be like sort of the main camp battle, I guess, is if you want to look at it that way when you go into spring training. I'll throw this out there. I think if you can get the full time DH on the free agent market, or maybe it's a trade, go and do that. I think that's probably your biggest you know desire at this point. But if you can't do that, I would go and trade for a one year rental starting pitcher. And just top off that rotation with a... You with mean a, like a splashy, like... I mean, is Shane Bieber a splash? Yes. Because I honestly... <laughs> yes, I, on, splash. <laughs> I honestly don't think that that's going to cost as much as people might suspect. He's $12 million, I believe, uh, for his remaining season. He was injured for a large portion of the second half last year, which I think could bring the price tag down at least a little bit. We know Cleveland wants to trade him. That's what they do with you know nearly all of their guys when they reach this point. I know he won a Cy Young Award, but so did Blake Snell. He's won two of them, including one last year. So this is, this is way cheaper than it would be to get somebody What's like you Snell. Blake Snell today? I know. I'm not a Snell guy. Really? I'm really not. No, and I didn't mean to make him sound like a bad dude earlier, although, <laughs> you know, you never know. Uh, I don't know him personally. But, I, dude, I know the Bieber thing, you're going to have to trade some pieces for him. But, honestly, if you're looking to win in the next two years, then what's wrong with having a rental player to round out that rotation? I mean, picture Zach Gallen, Merrill Kelly, Eduardo Rodriguez at the top. Brandon Fought with the way that he pitched in the playoffs, certainly deserves a spot in the rotation. And then throw in a veteran like like a, like a Bieber or I guess Corbin Burns is out there. I f somehow feel that would cost you more than Bieber. I do that if you cannot get a DH in the open market. Because I don't think I mean, you could do both. 
I mean, I'm sure you'd love to. I mean, I'm sure the organization would love to, too. I mean, um, those are two tremendous pitchers. And yeah, I think there's going to be a competitiveness factor to both of their trade markets. Um, yes, there was a lot of pitchers on the open market this year. Uh, we're going to see what the figures are for Yamamoto. We still have Blake Snell who's going to make a lot of money after winning the Cy Young. Don't like him. <laughs> I made that clear, didn't I? <laughs> I don't know why, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's. A, I got nothing against the guy. He walks a lot of guys, but other than that, yeah, he's I think it's. Enjoyable. I think it's the fact that he's only the best pitcher in baseball, like every couple of years, and the other years are just real bad. Like but he's very bad, streaky. But all right, all he's right. real streaky. I got you. I got you. Um, and then you still have Jordan Montgomery. There's still a bunch of guys, but for the teams who strike out on those guys. That's when okay, Dylan Cease, Corbin Burns, Shane Bieber. I, I think there will be a level of comp, a level of competition there that it's not going to be quite as cheap as you think. Um, but at the same time, the Diamondbacks haven't had to trade any of their prospects really this off season to get Suarez. They gave up Carlos Vargas and Sebi Savala, and Savala was a waiver claim at the end of last season. Yeah, good, you know, a useful backup catcher. Could have been the backup catcher. Absolutely, this year. but yeah. at the same time, not a huge trade asset. So, you know, they still have all their ammunition in that sense. They don't have Davis and De Los Santos at the moment. But you've that's got this another, stable of situation. young starting pitchers, though. Ryan Nelson, for as as rough as he was in 2023, right. he had an incredible outing in the World Series with the brightest lights and the biggest stage. Uh, I wonder what teams think of Ryan Nelson. He's also got some of the best stuff in terms of like velocity and things in their rotation, if you consider him a part of the rotation. Uh, you do have Tommy Henry, who I like I like and want to see more of, but if you're replacing him with somebody like Bieber, then sure, he can go. Uh, you do have Slade Ciccone that still needs to figure out what he is, Bryce Jarvis, Blake Walston was added to the 40-man, so you have this kind of plethora of guys who are, I don't want to call them tweeners because it's not like they've failed at the major league level, but you're trying to figure out where they fit, and you really only have one starting spot in your rotation right now, so it's going to be hard for them to find roles for all those guys I could see a couple of them moving potentially. I mean, that's 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 the option. That's you know keeping all of those guys together. You know, in some of these trades that they've made over the last couple of seasons, that's that benefit. Now you have a surplus. You have good organizational depth as far as who could fit into the back end of that rotation. So you can either roll with it or use it. To your point. So yeah, I think that's that's correct. Any other glaring questions you have heading into 2024 about the Arizona Diamondbacks? Uh, mostly extension based because okay. I mean, in spring training 2022, we saw the Cattell Marte and the Merrill Kelly extensions last year. There was the Corbin Carroll extension. Is there a big one brewing for 2024? Potentially there's obvious candidates for it. Like I mentioned, Christian Walker's entering the last year of his contract after he has continuously gotten better and better every year, back to back gold gloves. You know, he hit the hundred RBI plateau last year. Um, you know, Paul Seawalds, you know, has only been a, you know, only played for the Diamondbacks for a few months at the end of the season into the postseason, but he's, you know, they don't have to worry about closer this offseason. And that's something that has not been the case for them in a long time. You know, is he a potential candidate for another extension as well? So, um, and then obviously you have the younger guys like Gabriel Moreno. So, and then the guys who, you know, expire at the end of 2025, like Zach Gallen, although that's going to be a big, that's going to be a big one. That'll be a big uh, one. That'll be a big one. So yeah, just, you know, is there somebody who they can lock up for, you know, either, you know, this window or long-term? That's my biggest question going into the next season, besides what they do with the roster right now. We know one thing's for sure, no matter who wins the World Series, their players always get paid after that, almost always. Uh, I guess we'll wrap up with this then. Who needs to have a breakout season? I know this is a team that just went to the World Series, so a lot of people had good years last year. Who needs to break out for the Arizona Diamondbacks in 2024? You say that, but they also won 84 games. True. Very good season, very improved season, but you know, they've been very clear about they are improving an 84 win team that, you know, you know, in my opinion showed at their best they could beat anybody um, in the postseason, but, you know, anything can happen in the postseason. So, at the same time, there are still breakouts to be had with some of the younger players. Uh, I think looking for a level of consistency with Alec Thomas would go a huge, huge way. He's already one of the best defensive center fielders in baseball. We've seen the offensive upside. I mean, he has a top five, maybe top three most clutch hit in Diamondbacks history, postseason history at least, with that home run off Kimbrel. 
probably. I'd have to like go back. Obviously, it's you know Gonzo, Womack, you know maybe Cattell Marte's walk off against the Phillies is up there too. But that was incredible moment for AT. Um, but just a level of offensive consistency, a little bit better. You know, discipline against left-handed pitching. Um, can he be? you know, kind of solidify himself as an everyday center fielder as opposed to somebody who has to get platooned once in a while. So I guess he would be the one I look at. And then Brandon Fott would be the other. It felt like the breakout happened in the postseason, but that's still a one-month stretch. Can he do that over a full year? I'll throw in Jake McCarthy. Not that I expect him to be an everyday outfielder for this team, but he got sent down in 2023, figured some stuff out, but offensively still has yet to break out in a big way. He had a lot of steals in 2022, so he could be kind of... a lot of steals last year, too. Yeah, true. So he could be the speed guy off the bench and be a really good defensive replacement if they needed one in the outfield. Uh, Jordan Lawler's the other one. I, I obviously he it would have to be a breakout because he's still kind of a rookie um, and didn't play a lot last season for them when he got called up in September and in the playoffs he barely played at all. Um, so what role does he get in the future? I guess is my big question. You know he needs to break out in a way that proves that he's deserving of either the shortstop position over a guy in Perdomo who was an All Star or second base in the long run or whatever it ends up looking like for Lawler. Those are my two guys that I'm throwing out there for breakouts. I like that. I think, well, Lawler, you know, he's the number one prospect in the in this farm system. So, you know, first cup of coffee, bumps. Yeah. What does he look like the second time? Um, does he come up right away or does he spend a little bit more seasoning time in AAA before he comes back up? And then McCarthy, I mean, it felt like the breakout happened in 22, but then 23 was a step back. So you're right. If he can come back, you know, show some of those power numbers that they feel are in there. Um, and you have like four, like, you know, starting caliber outfielders that they can kind of work off of. I think that goes a long way. So the Arizona Diamondbacks continue to invest in players that they're quite familiar with. Lourdes Gurriel, reportedly, not officially yet, but reportedly back on the Arizona Diamondbacks for 2024 and the foreseeable future. For my friend Alex Weiner, I'm Steve Zinsmeister. Thanks for checking out the Ain't No Fang podcast here at Arizona Sports. Happy New Year!